So our next speaker um, is Dr. Dushan Lachina, and um, he's an assistant professor in indoor environmental quality at the School for Architecture, Civil, and Environmental Engineering at the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology in Lausanne. He's going to be talking about the utility use and misuse of low-cost consumer indoor particulate matter sensors. Thank you very much, Elizabeth, for the introduction, and thank, uh, thanks to the Academy, the committee, and the USCPA for the invitation. It's a, it's a great honor to be here, and greetings from Switzerland to uh, all the listeners in the United States and uh, in the rest of the world. So earlier today and also uh, seven days ago, we had a, a, a number of uh, great talks that covered uh, topics uh, such as uh, sources of PM indoors and outdoors, uh, their dynamics, uh, exposure and health effects. Uh, today, I'll be talking about slightly uh, different topic uh, about uh, low-cost consumer-based uh, indoor PM uh, sensors, which uh, in a way can also be an introduction to day three of this workshop in seven days from now. So uh, first, I think it's important to uh, present a couple of uh, caveats in the field of uh, low-cost uh, indoor PM sensing. This is a recent and rapidly growing field. Uh, majority of published literature on indoor PM uh, sensing with low cost uh, monitors. It's relatively recent, just a couple of years old. So that basically means what is relevant today uh, might already in, a, in some sense be outdated in just a few years from now. Also, I need to say that uh, more research is available for low cost sensors uh, for outdoor PM monitoring and uh, similar as a traditional uh, outdoor uh, PM monitoring, that pretty much is same reflected on the on the low cost monitoring. So that PM monitoring networks primarily are established for outdoor air, as you can see on this uh, map. And uh, this um, kind of maps would certainly not be available for indoor PM monitoring with low cost sensors. Also, I, I feel it's important to to. Uh, start with a couple of definitions because uh, like definitions of uh, monitors and sensors uh, can really vary from field to field, from person to person. So starting from the reference instrument, which is uh, uh, typically associated with a reference, uh, federal reference or equivalent method, but also in many studies, uh, uh, you know, typical lab-based instruments are, uh, which are calibrated for, for the purpose, uh, they can also be considered as reference instruments. Then we have a monitor, which is an integrated device, which encompasses uh, at least one sensor and other supporting components that create fully functional air quality data collection systems. And then we have a, a sensor, which is uh, simply a, a subcomponent of a monitor, which can detect uh, particles. I will also give a just brief uh, definition of uh, what it means to be low cost and high cost. When we talk about high cost lab grade instruments, we typically talk about uh, optical particle counters that can uh, that can uh, detect a single particle and the cost can range from three to 50,000 USD. On the other hand, uh, uh, low cost PM monitors, they're typically in uh, two orders of magnitude, lower price range, and uh, they typically operate based on the uh, bulk particle uh, detection or this uh, technology is also known as uh, photometers. Okay, uh, there are multiple phases of implementation of low-cost indoor PM sensors. Uh, they include uh, uh, sensor and monitor selection and the assessment, also deployment, whether it's uh, as individual or as a network, but also, uh, of course, data. It's uh, another important piece of the story because uh, millions of data points they don't uh, solve all the problems on their own. Uh, so data exploration, analysis, communication are certainly a big part of the story in order to provide the suitable outcomes. Uh, today, I'm gonna be focusing on the first two points only, uh, uh, selection, assessment, and deployment of the, of the sensors. But uh, of course, uh, when all these points are pursued together, we are typically in need of multidisciplinary uh, team. 
Okay, so there are different approaches to evaluate uh, PM sensors and the monitors. And what is interesting is uh, that only about 10% of studies uh, made reference to uh, published uh, protocols such as uh, air quality specs or the US EPA. So researchers typically adopt their own protocol for assessment of sensors and monitors. And this uh, unfortunately results in a variable uh, judgment criteria for what do we consider to be good enough. Uh, uh, there is a vast majority of studies that differ in methodology adopted. Uh, one big difference is duration of testing. Way more studies are performed on a short-term basis rather than long. And uh, we we know that it is possible that the uh, performance of PM, PM sensors can drift over time, either due to sensor aging or dust accumulation in sensor and so on. Furthermore, uh, measurement environments, typically uh, most of the studies are done in on the lab-based environment, so relatively few on, in the field. Then also methods that differ in a number of replicated technologies and the reference methods uh, utilized. And just to exemplify uh, that issue, uh, a Ubot monitor was uh, tested in a couple of papers and each of them differed quite a bit in terms of duration of testing and uh, uh, measurement uh, uh, like reference method used. So for the one and the very same sensor uh, performance, the results could uh, differ uh, as you can see in this table. So when we talk about uh, performance indicators for the low cost PM sensors, uh, we have a range of uh, factors to consider, comparison with the reference instruments, uh, repeatability, a limit of detection and so on. I'll be covering a few of those. So uh, when compared to a reference, uh, uh, reference uh, measurements, uh, a high degree, uh, there is a high degree of correlation. Uh, typically about uh, our, our square is about 0.5, but if those studies are performed in the lab environment, low cost PM sensors typically uh, perform even better, uh, typically 0.8, 0.8, nine is the R square and the low cost PM 2.5 sensors are typically within factor of two from the reference for the lab based measurements. Of course, in the field, uh, these sensors can suffer significant response changes, uh, which can be attributed to changing conditions for particle composition, particle size, but also uh, dynamic uh, variable factors such as the indoor climate. So, uh, of course, comparing the lab-based and field-based assessments, uh, there are some uh, critical differences. In the lab, it's uh, typically hard to maintain a low level of PM concentration for an uh, extended period of time. Uh, composition and concentration of test aerosols uh, might not be representative of the study area. And on the other hand, in the field, uh, there is a variable particle composition, size, and environmental factors which need to be taken into account. When it comes to repeatability and reprodu reproducibility, uh, for majority of the sensors, uh, generally, uh, uh, there is a high intramodal consistency, typically about 0.8. And uh, again, uh, these numbers typically come from the lab-based studies. Uh, they're uh, basically uh, reported reproducibility uh, could be affected uh, with a PM concentration range, sensor type, but also longitudinal performance. For example, reprodu reproducibility of these uh, uh, sensors for uh, cigarette smoke is higher compared to the Arizona test dust. And uh, there is uh, also, for example, risk of accumulation of the larger particles, which would be uh, the example of Arizona test dust uh, compared to the cigarette smoke. Also, um, uh, organic PM uh, do uh, typically come out as a, in a higher concentration compared to inorganic PM, even though the sensors are exposed to, at the very same concentration level because uh, of the of the uh, absorption and scattering uh, properties. Uh, of course, uh, scattering is higher for the organic PM. Then another uh, interesting uh, criteria is the limit of detection. Sensor performance uh, can typically be compromised at these low PM levels and Typically, we talk about 10 micrograms per cubic meters. Um, and here in Switzerland, we've been doing a couple of field tests uh, in 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 quite you know pristine uh, environment uh, with respect to the PM 2.5, and 
a lot of sensors would simply just be reporting zeros. So uh, here we can see uh, some lab-based tests of different sensors exposed to cigarette smoke. Uh, when, when we talk about relatively higher PM 2.5 mass, uh, we can see that sensors consistently uh, uh, report uh, well compared to the reference. But when we talk about concentrations below 20 micrograms per cubic meter, certain sensors uh, do fail uh, pretty much. They are unable to um, detect these lower concentrations. So, you know, a, a brief summary on, of this is that, of course, it's necessary to calibrate uh, each sensor individually for a specific environment where they will be used, but also for expected uh, particle uh, concentration and size range. And well, let, last but not least, uh, environmental factors such as uh, humidity and temperature also do um, uh, play a role in the sensor output. Uh, Low-cost sensors do not dry uh, particles unlike uh, traditional uh, kind of instruments. And this can lead, of course, to compromise accuracy of the sensors as a function of particle hygroscopicity. Um, so humidity is... Uh, definitely more important than uh, temperature. And a couple of studies found that uh, typically at 85% uh, relative humidity or 90% relative humidity, sensor performance might be compromised. And also uh, the composition effect could be also associated with the uh, uh, particle uh, hydroscopicity and uh, it can also interact with the relative humidity levels so that uh, certain mixture of aerosols could be more susceptible to like relative humidity compared to the others. So I'm gonna dare to give a few recommendations for different uh, stakeholders based on the several points shared um, for the standard and guideline developers. I think there is a need to formulate start, uh, standard guidelines for assessing the short and long-term performance sensors, which can be used by everyone for researchers, uh, there is a need to standardize performance testing to allow intercomparison between different studies. And also we need to uh, calibrate our, our devices uh, uh, to be used under conditions in which uh, the, the study will take place. And then for a personal view for the sellers and manufacturers, uh, I think it would be nice if there is a a selection of sensors and monitors which are pre-calibrated for various uh, types of indoor environments so uh, end users could, could simply uh, select like customized type of the sensors and i think uh, also they should probably offer more transparency for calibration algorithms as we can see on this uh, graph on the on the right side uh, uh, two uh, or to two of the very same type of the PM sensors, which are embedded in different type of monitors can uh, show very different performance. And uh, this is of course attributed to uh, proprietary cal uh, calibration algorithms, which uh, end users typically don't have access to. And for non-expert users, uh, you know, I guess they can hope that others will do their job or maybe they can become a friend with a air quality expert. Okay, uh, I want also want to touch up upon several deployment challenges and needs uh, at present. What is interesting that uh, continuous indoor PM monitoring is not required by any uh, local building or health or safety code. We're talking only about uh, completely voluntary actions at this stage. And uh, one example would be a well building standard. They, for example, uh, not require, but uh, offer as an option for additional points that uh, one PM sensor should be placed on every 325 uh, square meters, which uh, comes uh, to some, uh, in some way quite arbitrary. But in order for them to uh, develop more accurate and more precise guidelines, there is a, a set of research questions that can uh, help improve these guidelines. Uh, some of them are how do we ensure long-term performance in the field environments? What is the optimal time resolution for low-cost sensors? And what is the optimal sensor placement and density? You know, is it that we need a higher number of sensor or lower number of sensor, but higher accuracy? And uh, these are just some of uh, the questions. Then, as we could hear uh, from uh, 
uh, Bill Nazarov uh, talk and other talks uh, today that indoor aerosols are episodics and uh, indoor spaces are frequently associated to strong spatial gradients, which are typically associated with humans and their activities. And uh, as a result, uh, each of us, every person is kind of enveloped with this uh, personal cloud, personal PM 2.5 or 10 cloud. And uh, these, uh, these kind of effects cannot be effectively captured with stationary outdoor and uh, indoor and especially outdoor uh, stations. So uh, one of the uh, certainly deployment needs is uh, development of portable, inexpensive and robust uh, continuous PM sensors, which uh, has been a growing field. And uh, these uh, efforts are really important to improve connections between uh, indoor spaces and exposure to PM. I could make a, a similar example for the comparison between building and outdoor scale because there is a strong interplay between the two. Outdoor air pollution is an indoor problem as we could uh, hear earlier today. Uh, so uh, we, we certainly need to consider how do we deploy these low cost PM sensors both an indoor and outdoor scale in an integrated manner. So we actually know how to deal better with the events such as wildfires and uh, you know, simply if we live in urban environments, et cetera. A few more things. The particles which are smaller than 0.3 microns, they do not uh, scatter enough light. And that means that uh, uh, ultrafine particles cannot be detected by these optical uh, methods. So uh, I also want to uh, say a word of caution here because uh, a lot of ultrafine particle sources do emit uh, also particles above 0.3 microns and even in some spaces with a high concentration of UFB there could be a uh, agglomeration effect. So that means that uh, depending on a source low cost PM 2.5 sensors could be in fact also detecting UFB and uh, they could also partially be effective in their control. But uh, certainly we do have a need for uh, development of new measurement approaches for detecting the ultrafine particles. And well, last but not least, uh, uh, this is maybe, uh, I, I've been showing in the previous slide uh, that uh, there are trade-offs uh, which arise when the low cost PM sensors are, are used instead of uh, the existing reference methods. Uh, two questions I'm throwing in here. Perhaps we can talk about it during the panel discussion. Do we need low cost sensors to be as good as the high grade instruments? My take is that probably not, but they certainly need to go through further refinement. Uh, but uh, it's probably good enough if the sensor is accurate in a relative sense rather than in an absolute sense. Also, can the sensor data uh, serve as a new class rather than a proxy for traditional measurements? I believe yes. Uh, these uh, technologies are basically changing the landscape, how we uh, do indoor uh, monitoring. And uh, if we collect good data, if this data is uh, well treated, we can certainly acquire possibilities which transcend um, uh, those of traditional measurements. So. I think uh, that there are plenty of uh, new opportunities and needs for us because uh, low cost PM sensors do enable uh, something that we haven't been able to do before. And uh, you know this is important because the traditional snap snapshot measurements simply, as we could see, uh, they can, uh, they have many limitations. They can uh, miss many important features of exposure. They can lead to exposure misclassification, but with a new type of technology such as these, uh, we might be able to transcend that in the, in the future. And we all know that there is currently really increased interest and need in this technology due to COVID and uh, it's largely driven by the green building industry. So, uh, just a few more points. Uh, at present, uh, there is no sensor which is ideal for all application. We need to identify optimal trade-off. Uh, I think that currently for indoor PM management, uh, PM 2.5 sensor as they are now are probably good enough. But uh, in uh, instances where we need a precise and absolute quantification, then uh, they're uh, still probably not ready to replace more established uh, methods. 
And when it comes to research needs, there are many, but probably one of the most important in a, a short and long term is uh, that uh, we, we need a more uh, field validations, which are long term field validation and developments in order to assess these evolving technologies and to draw the links uh, with respect to the health effects. So I'll stop here. Thanks for the attention and I look forward to questions.